And sitting directly next to me is Dr. Donna Harris. She's the assistant professor at the University of Rochester Warner School in Educational Leadership. And in the middle is Teresa Woodson. She's the director of the Urban Suburban Program for Monroe Juan Boses. And Toyin Anderson Willis is at the very end. And she is a 2013 graduate of the Parent Leadership Training Initiative. And this is a program all about providing parents with skills to lead change uh, for the next generation. And Toyin is also a parent of a Rochester student. And uh, we'll just go ahead and get started again at a certain point. Uh, I will ask the audience to come forward and, and ask any questions or make any comments that you would like to. And we'll go ahead and get started. And we heard in the film, and if you think about the name of the title of the documentary, American Promise, America is often referred to as the land of opportunity. And, and yet there are things, there are these invisible barriers that make that very hard uh, and can prevent the American dream from, from coming into fruition. And I want to share some stats with you. Uh, African American boys are twice as likely as white boys to be held back in elementary school. They are three times as likely to be suspended from school and they're half as likely to graduate from college. And this is the black male achievement gap. And the mission of the filmmakers for American Promise, Michelle Stevenson and uh, Joe Brewster, Eaters' parents, is for this film to galvanize a national conversation. And uh, you know, what does it take for parents and educators and the community to support African American boys academically? You know, what will it take to improve self-image and the way that they feel about themselves in this world? And uh, how can behavior change be promoted? And those are difficult questions to ask. And um, but tonight, hopefully, there are real solutions that actually do work. And that's what we want to focus on tonight. Uh, in addition to the challenges, and we've, we've got our, our panelists here uh, to help us do just that. And to begin, I, I want to start uh, by talking about this decision by the parents, by Idris's parents and uh, by Shayon's parents to send them to Dalton. And Dalton is in New York City, but we all know we have Daltons here. We've got, you know, Charles Finney. We've got uh, Allendale Columbia School. We've got public schools, uh, Pittsford Sutherland, Cobbles Elementary. They're here. And, uh, you know, Joe Brewster, Idris's father, he said that Dalton, in the very beginning of the film, he said Dalton will open doors for his son for the rest of his life. And I want to ask our panelists just to start, which doors do schools like Pittsburgh Sutherland and Cobbles and Dalton open uh, for, for boys? And uh, in particular, what are they offering that other schools don't offer? I mean, one of the things is the curriculum, right? Giving students access to the curriculum that will prepare them for upper tier colleges. Because uh, Dalton, they said 31% of their kids went on to uh, the Ivy League schools, MIT, or Stanford. And so these are the top institutions in the country. And so that gives them access to future occupational opportunities, graduate school opportunities, and ultimately prepares them for power. And so those are the things, I mean, some of it's the socialization, right, and the norms of people with power. So that's one of the things that uh, private schools or elite suburban schools provide kids. But the baseline is the curriculum, the socialization, the different opportunities, let's say, even to travel, learn an, another language. So that gives kids different capital that they can use to navigate um, different opportunities, whether it's economic or political opportunities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Teresa? Um, I think some of it is also um, exposure. I think that's a big piece that, uh, you know, whatever the school may be, there is um, just the exposure uh, to something different, something other than what may be your norm. And I think that is just a big, uh, big piece uh, to see the possibilities of things not thought of before, opportunities not thought of before, things not exposed to, uh, that parents and students can then capitalize on but at least being exposed to it so you know about it, you know that it exists. Yeah. And so I'm thinking about the question that you asked. I'm thinking schools like Dawson and, and um, the schools here, they gear their curriculum, which is the key piece, 
to attract well the wealthy and the well to do or interested parents and families that want their kids in those Ivy League colleges. So I think they gear a lot of um, interesting things to those families for that purpose for their kids. To make sure when they go through them schools and are done, colleges are very attractive and they are attractive and can get into those colleges very easily. It's interesting you say that because as you think that would be this easy and natural, easy selection then for parents, but uh, Idris's parents and, and Shayon's parents, they hesitated uh, with the decision to send their kids. And uh, Stacy Summers, this is Shayon's mom, she said, when we put our children in this environment, what perception are they going to have of themselves? And is this going to be something that will help them in the future or something that will hinder them? And I thought it was an eye-opening question. And, you know, Teresa, to some, to some city parents, the Urban Suburban Program is that Dalton experience. And, and for those of you who don't know, Urban Suburban was developed in the 1960s, and it was really to give city kids an option to, to attend schools in the suburbs. And the mission was to put an end to racial isolation and segregation when it comes to academics. And so based on your role, I'm interested to know, how would you answer Shayan's mother's question? I think it is, and, and I'll speak to that I um, have four children and two participated in the program and two didn't. But I think as parents, you have to know your child. You have to know their, their strengths, their weaknesses, the kind of environment that they can thrive in. I don't think urban suburban is a one size fit all. And I think you as parents have to be conscious of the kind of um, is going into and I had that kind of experience. Uh, my family, we also had a child attend Allendale, Columbia. So we had a taste of RCSD. We had a taste of private school. We had a taste of um, parochial school because um, they also attended St. Louis. And so what we did was we really tried to find that, that good fit for our, for our children. And as I said, it worked for two and two went to ultimately graduated from city schools and those were the, were the best fits for them. But you make a conscious um, effort to shop around, we did, our family did, and find the best fit for our children. Um, that's what we did, but you, you, you don't take it lightly. Um, you attend all these events that will give you an opportunity to kind of dissect what that school is like, what that environment is like, including um, the curriculum, social, what are going to be some of those barriers, what can we do as a family and not do. Uh, for example, transportation, traveling long distances seem to be a concern uh, for the families in, in, the, in the film. Um, are we willing to make that sacrifice? Yes, we are. Um, you know, they're going to, our expectation is that once our children begin to make friends that those, those friends in the suburb come to our home in the city uh, because um, it's my responsibility to educate them about who we are and what we're about. So it's not just a, a, a one-way piece. So I think all of that went into the mix. You mentioned that parents need to shop around and I think when, when we talk to, when I talk to parents in the city, uh, there's this, this fear in terms of options when it comes to, to shopping around in the city school district. Uh, you know, Shayan's parents said they don't have a problem with the public school system, uh, but they said that if you can find a public school in your district, that, that will work well for, for your child. Uh, you know, and so a couple stats on Banneker, and that's where Shayan eventually graduated. It's one of the best schools in Brooklyn. Uh, it graduated students with an average SAT score of 1430. That's compared to Dalton's uh, 2200. And so, but the, the point I also want to make is the city school district has some great schools. I mean, we're looking at School of the Arts, World of Inquiry, uh, Wilson Magnet, and yet parents are leaving the district at a, at a rapid pace, well, I don't want to say rapid, but at a, at a fair pace, considering that enrollment is declining. It's something that we hear and we talk about uh, you know, so often. Why are parents forced, currently forced, to look at private schools, even charter schools? There's this big debate now. Are charter schools taking funding away from, from public schools? Why do you think that they're forced to make these types of decisions um, to find a high quality education for their kids? Is it okay if I comment? Because yeah. I sit there right now. Um, personally, 
I think we have to do that because there is not enough of the School of the Arts. There's not enough of no, fi number 58 school. So why you have 10,000 kids and one school can only take 500, you still have this vast majority of kids and every parent wants the best for their child. And the opportunity that's out there for all of us is not equal. And you live in a district, there is no school that's reputable to you as a parent. And I mean, personally, I'm like, I wanted my child at number 58 school. They weren't chosen. So then I'm left with the other options that I'm not happy with. So then I'm gonna find a school that I think is best fit for my child and for me. And to me, that's just safer and better. And that sometimes turns out to be a charter school. So that's my personal story. Come up, <laughs> come on up. Do you, you can come at any, oh, come up, the mic is right here. I just wanted to say from my own experience, what I saw that, um, But just so, you, you can't, I just, just wanna let you know, I don't know if we are, we are filming this, and so we wanna make sure that those watching online, when it goes online, can hear your questions. Oh, so that's why we have a mic, yeah, we have a mic right here, if, if you can. Okay, do you mind coming to the, to the mic right here? No, I'm always on chat. Okay. <laughs> Well, I don't want you to be shy, so why don't you tell me what your comment is and I'll repeat it just so we can make sure it's heard. church and um, I, I guess um, parent teachers associations and, and even um, uh, parental into visiting can allow us to get back to the matter of bringing up a child with discipline and with an understanding of what is the end game that's all that's needed the audience member, just so we can make sure that we have this clearly. So she mentioned, were the parents hypercritical? The boys both turned out well, they're both in school, and from the beginning, uh, were, were the parents overly involved or too hard on them? Also, she mentioned, you know, the household and the role of the household, this redevelopment of discipline, uh, and then also outside sources, you know, playing a role. So I, I'll let you take it however you want. So I think that the parents, I, I, in some ways you could perceive some of the pressure that the parents felt to make sure that both Shayan and Idris were doing well. I mean, that, they felt that responsibility. I, I feel, I don't know whether I agree with the comment that was shared. I think it's a catch-22. A lot of times we say we want parents to be involved parents of color, low-income parents are always in, in the educational research that I read are negatively viewed. So this is what we have example of a middle-class uh, parents who attempted to uh, socially engineer their children's educational experience. And it was similar to uh, what the white middle-class parents were doing. So I, I don't know whether I can say you know, make a judgment about whether they were putting too much pressure. 
Dalton seemed to be a place that parents had to stay on their kids to help them to negotiate. I mean, Dalton is a top tier uh, private institution in the country. And so uh, you have to, parents have to have that level of commitment. I think there was some fr frustration that the parents wanted the boys to do things that they didn't, they weren't always consistent. But in some ways, if you left the child to uh, do things on his own devices, potentially he would not follow up. And so it seems to be that the parents had to, in some ways, help kids negotiate um, the Dalton School experience and getting into college. I, I don't think that any kid gets through the K-12 system into higher education without a support system. I think some of the examples that came out of the movie was that there were these invisible resources. The example of the, Idris's father talked about the fact that the parents at Dalton were paying the tuition and then paying another $30,000 for tutoring. I know um, that they didn't even talk about uh, having coaches to help kids to apply to college and negotiate that process. So there's a lot of resources that parents in those schools provide to those kids that was not represented in the movie. And so I, I think that they did the best that they could to, to negotiate um, for their children. And so I don't know, it, it's the, the portrayals of the homes, Shayon's home and uh, Idris's home, it looked different, but I don't know whether I can make a judgment about that. Clearly he had parents who had middle class jobs. I mean, Idris' father was a, a psychiatrist, but clearly both or uh, one of the parents went on to college. And so, I mean, I think that how parents negotiate with their kids vary, right? And so I, I can't make a judgment about which one was better than the other. Um, so I, I just think that the parents I, seemed to do the best that they could given the context of being in a very high stakes environment. I want to go back just a little bit. We, we talked about the, the choice to select Dalton and to select the schools and what parents have to do and, and, and shopping around. What I liked about this film is, is watching the, it was powerful to see from age nine to, to graduation and to watch the transition. As, as the young men transition, what, I'd like to know what you identified as those things that were difficult, were challenging for them. We, as we found out in the film, that Sian was dyslexic. So, I mean, school on a whole was difficult for him. To me, the environment for them, you know, was difficult. Because as I sat there and I watched the film, and I, and I listened to Idris talk about, you know, when they went out and they had the opportunity to kiss girls and he was never able to dance. And I'm like, I felt as a parent, like, you know, he was isolated just because he was one of the minority in that school. You know, so I'm like thinking, I mean, they had struggles as a family, struggles as young men to try to fit into the culture of this school, given that they were at a disadvantage. And to me, somehow labeled by this school, because when the parents talked about them alone being in this tutoring program, just both of them alone, you know what I'm saying? It, to me, it just sets them up like, okay, we identify you as having problems. Like the parents said, maybe we're wrong, but you're African-Americans. We cannot fit you in here. And that's pretty much what they said. So, I mean, they just seemed like they were fighting a losing battle to me. Just always a step behind what was required of them. So it was a struggle for them from the beginning to the end. Teresa, what did you see? What, did, what, what stood out to you as the unique challenges for, for them through the process? Um, I think when you're in those kinds of high stakes environment, um, the skill set that you come, come in with, um, the, um, I think a better way of putting it is oftentimes um, you'll hear families sitting around speaking about, 
oh, my child is in, you know, first grade or second grade, they can read, they can write, they, you know, they can identify the, this word or that word. But when they go into um, um, the majority environment, many times those students may be two or three grade levels ahead. And so, um, and this is a, a, a sort of a stereotype, but if you're in the city and your child is doing that and then you move into another environment, you may be one or two grade levels behind already. Within your peer group where you previously were, you may have been that top student in that class. But when you're transferring uh, uh, to the predominantly a majority environment, you may um, just be in the middle of the pack. And so I'm not sure what that does to a student um, in terms of their uh, confidence, their self-esteem, if those conversations haven't taken place prior to that child going uh, uh, to, to those suburban schools, I think. And one of the young men mentioned it, um, it's sort of, my, my parents just put me there. I don't know how I got there. <laughs> and as parents, we do. We, we make a conscious decision and choice uh, because we believe that it positions our children to be in a better place. Um, that upward mobility that we say education uh, provides uh, for us. And so we're, we're taking that chance, we're taking that leap, and we're going to, um, if we have that opportunity, um, let them participate in the program. But I think like anything, you have to constantly nurture, support, encourage them as they're going along. Because, um, you know, whether we like it or not, looks are the first thing that you see. And so you look different, um, you may talk differently as one of the young boys uh, um, alluded to, how, how I talk, how I look, how I dress, what my classmates uh, think of me uh, because of where I come from. They may not actually uh, verbalize it, but um, I hear some of the uh, students in my program, especially the older students, um, well, uh, when I talk to some of my friends in the suburban schools, they think that uh, Everybody in the city listens to rap music. Everybody wears saggy pants. Um, that nobody lives in a house. We all live in apartments. Uh, I'm like, really? <laughs> um, so you know, for for me, it's it's so important to uh, not only allow city students to go to suburban schools, but to have those suburban students have that same kind of experience because I think they're missing out in so many ways that they're. Uh, can oftentimes just be sheltered by the environment that they're in, that they never really get to see outside of Pittsford or Brighton or what have you. So. I want to talk a little bit about that the, in terms of uh, something that personally hit me was, and you mentioned it, uh, when Idris mentioned, you know, he, was, he sometimes gets teased. I think certain things, we, when it comes to culture, may get swept under the rug and we may not talk enough about and the impact that it can have on a child. We talk about the socio-emotional aspect. And uh, you know, he said, I sometimes get made fun of with my basketball team for, for talking white. And uh, you know, personally, that hit me because I'm biracial. My father is, is from the Congo. My mother is white. And I can remember in the transition from middle school to high school, students said the same. My peers said the same thing uh, about me. And I think. Today, you don't hear that, because I think people may say you sound like a man, my voice is deep enough to. But you know, we, in all seriousness, this is something that, that, that has not gone away. It stays with a child, and it, it's something that, it hit me in the pit of my stomach when, when I heard that, that part mentioned. And so I wanna, you know, of, of all things, um, kids could tease each other about, why does this one thing seem to have so much staying power? I'm, I'm interested in this, how language binds us to culture. Donna, I'll give that. So I guess that this whole issue of like talking white, I mean, there's been some discussion in educational research whether that means you're trying to act white and how that's related to academic achievement. For Idris, it was just a little bit different for his peers on the basketball team. It was clear that his parents was trying to um, keep him uh, in environments with kids of his own racial ethnic background. And so this idea of how we speak connects us to a cultural community. But I, I think there's tensions around that as well because there are stereotypes about well, what does it mean to talk black? And how does that relate to 
whether you're more black or less black. I mean, so that is when people say that, people may be questioning, well, where do you fit on the spectrum of blackness? Any questions from the audience, feel free to, to come down to the microphone right here. You can, yeah, you can come. <laughs> I don't know. If, I don't. Um, hello. All right. Mic check. But it's a, um, it's a pleasure hearing all of you ladies. Hello. I just had a. Um, I don't know if it's, my name is Keith Harris. I guess we're filming. <laughs> 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 so, so I was just like, you know, in terms of uh, education. Now, we have to be real here. That's educational genocide going on. And denying a quality education to the youth on a holistic level terms of the American um, society as a whole is actually a violation of, of, of particularly black males constitutional rights. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness can't happen. What kind of life you have without a quality education in a knowledge-based economy? Can't have it. <laughs> so that's one thing, you can't have a quality of life. Life, liberty, if you don't know your rights, how you gonna have liberty? So life, liberty, and then the pursuit of happiness. You can't pursue your dreams if you don't have the education. So life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness, this is this constitutional violations going on. This is a dehumanizing situation. It's a system in place. He said now, educational <laughs> genocide. How, what are your thoughts on, on what he had to say? Industry. <laughs> um, let's talk, let's be real here. So some people would say, um, there's a difference between education and schooling. And some people would say this current system perpetuates, uh, it doesn't necessarily, like you say, uh, support and culturally reinforce African Americans because of the Eurocentric focus of the curriculum, right? No, what I'm saying basically is that the, the entire system is bankrupt. We have to really start from the ground on up when it comes to educating black males. What's going on now is a game being played because the educational setting that they have now is not conducive to learning, particularly in the city schools. Yeah, we've Keith, got some you. young black males in the audience. What, what do they feel they need um, you know, to, to support them? I mean, I can say what I feel as a woman. I, I think as a male, there's some things that, are, as a female, there's just some things I can't answer just in terms of what, what that male would need. So I would turn it back to, to the audience. I see a hand there. Yes, sir. So I'm, I'm gonna speak now. My name is Richard Warren. Do you mind coming to the mic? I'm not, I'm not doing the best, but I'm gonna okay. step my way. Can you hear me? No, no. If you, it's just, it's just a, if you just wanna come to the mic and then they can. Good evening, everybody. My name is um, Winterborne Jones, and I'm from Washington, D.C., and so I'm 25, and so the characters in the um, movie really resonated with me. And one of the resources that I was given, um, particularly because my story was the story of the young man who lost his brother. And, of course, my grades suffered, and um, the system as it was could not understand or was not equipped to give me what I needed in that very um, trying time. And so it was the independent resources of the teachers, the heart of the teachers that pulled me out of that system and were able to support me emotionally, tapped into my creativity, and that is how I ended up succeeding in school. I went from my brother being murdered, from being a 4.0 student, my brother being murdered, um, graduating with a 1.9. I attended Fisk University in Nashville, Tennessee. So the problem was never my ability. It was, the, it was how do you um, uh, sort of um, learn in context of community, all the things that happen in a student's life that may affect their ability to score on a test or whatever. And so with a 1.9, I attended Fisk. And at Fisk, and I really want to challenge this idea of um, the Daltons being the only place or, or, or better equipped um, to give students a sense of power. Because when I arrived at Fisk University, 
Um, the first person I met, and I thought she was Caucasian, for no offense, was the former Secretary of Energy of the United States, Hazel O'Leary, which happened to be the president mm -hmm. of Fisk. She took me by my hand my freshman year, walked me through all four years, whether it be cultural exposure, dressing, etiquette. As one of my Rochester um, mentors says, uh, Dr. Paul Burgett, um, one must be um, fluent in the sacraments of culture. But it's all about allocating those resources, both educationally, financially, and emotionally. And that's what leveled the playing field. It was never about our ability. And I'm talking inner city DC, off of Georgia Avenue, um, drugs on the outside. We happen to live in a house, very religious family. But it was about people taking the time to give us what we needed, and here I am. I graduated from Fisk. At the top of my class, I came on full scholarship to Colgate, Rochester, Crozier Divinity School, and I'm the youth pastor of Mount Olivet Baptist Church. So it wasn't ability. It was someone stopping to ask the question, what else does this young black male need? Mm -hmm. As murders are going on outside, and so I don't think oftentimes we stop to ask the question, what's really going on here? Because as the student, you know, um, I forget his name. Shayon. Shayon, mm -hmm. um, he was creative, he was smart, he was witty, he was attractive. Um, and for me, he was more in tune, he might not have known it, with his authentic sense of self versus the other character having to grapple and negotiate, who am I really in this context? There's something to be said there. And so after his brother passing, it was the counselor right. Right. that paused to ask that question. So I really want to push that notion of power, exposure, and stopping to ask the question, what else outside of the academic support mm -hmm. do these students need to be successful? And I happen to be one that was bright, witty, creative, but I needed the emotional support having the trauma in our lives. So we have to first recognize that trauma happens. Yes, that's right. mm -hmm. And then how does a student, which might not have that advocacy, negotiate that emotional piece in a classroom for eight hours looking at a teacher and with concepts that really don't mean anything in their lives? Mm -hmm. Without that extra force of love, care, and time, many fall by the wayside. Mm -hmm. I happen to be one who had some external pieces like church, teachers, counseling that helped me through that process. So that's, I just wanted to add that I'm 25, so I, I didn't research this. I'm living it, mm -hmm. just graduated from Colgate, but that was my extra. It was the mentors, the yes. teachers, the counselors that added that extra piece. Thank you. Thank you. So can I add, yeah. so to um, add on to that, the socio-emotional piece is a really key issue that needs to be addressed for African-American males and other students of color. But one of the things that came out the movie was this whole issue of expectations. So even though those kids were at Dalton, there were still questions about were they really capable. Uh, the other issue was, and this has been documented in research about how black boys are constructed as a problem because how Idris with the whole issue had, the, had supposedly a fight with the little boy. He said he didn't have a fight, but then they said he was lying. And so that is also common that black boys are seen as a problem. Teachers may be afraid of black boys have uh, stereotypes about black males being uh, hostile and violent. So that plays out in terms of how they're treated, right? And so if you're a problem, you're suspended, you're not in school, that gives you a signal that you don't really count. And so those are the things that push African-Americans males out. And so that's systemic, that we have to deal with the kind of gender and race-based um, stereotypes and racist views around African-American males. Do you think there's, I want to, interesting when he made this point, that the gentleman, the, the Dalton Middle School, uh, one of the middle school directors in the film, she said, we don't have the same problem usually with African-American girls. There's a cultural disconnect between independent schools and African-American boys, and we see a high rate of kids not being successful. And the question is why, where's the disconnect, what's going wrong, what are we doing as a school that is not supporting these guys? What, you mentioned the systemic way that, that, that people, the, look at African-American boys. You mentioned it's a systemic issue. Where else does this disconnect lie that, we're, that 
the, as the gentleman said, the, these connections are not being made. Because I believe, because of the stereotype, they expect every child to act in a certain way. So, I mean, dealing with the Caucasian boys, their behavior tends to be different from these rambunctious African American. And then it seems like, you know, they have all these issues because you always are paying attention. They can't sit still, they can't stay focused. So part of the disconnect is how to emotionally, like you said, support these boys and looking at them as individuals and looking at them with individual needs and try to tap into what drives them and help them be productive and successful. And that's where the disconnect is because they're expecting, expecting a certain behavior and when that is not portrayed, instead of trying to dig deeper, they dismiss them. Well, I'm also wondering too, when, when you've got a crop of uh, young adults going into education, and um, for the most part, I don't know at the, at the Warner School, but if you have young uh, uh, people coming into education, how familiar are they with urban education? How familiar are they with uh, young black men or Hispanic or you know Asian for that matter, I'm not sure. And are they prepared uh, to come into these communities and uh, really, um, you know, do they come in with a, a, a preconceived set of notions and ideas? about their ability to learn, um, about, uh, for example, uh, two young boys being very physical. Is that normal? You know, I know my, my sons, they, they played together all the time and I didn't think anything of it. But if they had gone to school at recess and played that way, I'm sure, you know, in, in, in a white school, they would have been looked at being too, too physical, too aggressive. But that was normal, you know, in the household. Two boys just roughhousing around playing. Um, so I, d I don't know if, if the uh, student teachers are prepared to come to those kind of environments. Or if you can't sit still, do you need to be on Ritalin? Or um, if you become a behavioral issue, as she suggested, we'll just dismiss you from the room because you don't fit into the norm and we're trying to uh, get this curriculum taught because we've got uh, so, so much to get done and so much time and that's disrupting. So, um, And I think also in the documentary, um, I think it was the, um, it might have been an administrator in the uh, um, Banneker School where he talked about um, be before we became integrated where it, it, was a, it was a segregated school and the kind of care that was given in predominantly black schools. And if, you know, if there was a youngster who came to school and they weren't kept that that teacher took it upon themselves or, or themselves to take that young person out and clean them up and, and bring them back into that classroom so they felt comfortable, so they felt a part of it. So talking about how, um, to some degree, segregation was good. Um, it, it reinforced that positive peace on young boys as well as girls. Well, and I wanna ask you in terms of the, the parental angle and engagement and equipping parents with skills that they need, what are suggestions that you would make as a parent that to, to some of these challenges, you know, we, the audience member mentioned that some, some of the parents in this film seem to be um, hypersensitive. For those who may feel as though they don't have the skills that they need, what would you suggest to them? And believe you me, a lot of parents do feel that way. Trust me, because I mean, when they go into schools, they feel a certain way because teachers and even principal administrators kind of talk down to these parents. So, I mean, what I would suggest to parents, you are the most important teacher in your child's life. Always remember that. And nobody in that school knows your child more than you do. And you are a key component in this entire cycle of life for your child. And the school cannot function without you as a partner. So never ever think you are beneath anybody involved in the process. And stand your ground and advocate for your child and let them know if you don't understand, explain it to me. You know, break it down so I can understand it. But just never ever lose hope and never ever forget that your child needs you the most. They're gonna move on from grade to grade, teacher to teacher, but you are the one constant that's gonna remain. And you, they always have to know that. You know, we, when it comes to these issues, it's always, when we talk about it in the news, I know we cover it a lot and there's, there's, um, 
always this negative uh, connotation, you know, where the black male achievement gap, and, and it's, it's an issue, and I think sometimes we don't talk about uh, the solution so much and, and what can be done. And I, I, wanna, I want to get your take on that. Um, what, are, what are things that you think we are not getting right in the media when it comes to this? There, the solutions that we've missed, solutions that parents may not be aware of or educators or administrators may not be aware of that you've identified uh, can work when we take this film into consideration. So I think that there are examples of, of like black male academies mm -hmm. have been tried in Chicago and other places because it's an a, a institution that may have black male teachers who will be role models uh, for African American males. The curriculum can be focused to uh, connect with them kind of culturally. And so um, the Urban Academy in Chicago has been touted as being successful for preparing young African-American males, like 98% of their graduates within the last couple of years have gone on to college. So that is one example of a solution uh, to address the, the disconnect for African-American males. But ultimately, it's all about kind of having a, a curriculum that kids can find themselves in. Because issues of racial identity are, are really important. It came out in the movie um, in which they talked about it to some extent. But I think that racial identity is really core. How can you really be successful if you don't know who you are? And so I think that's a really key thing that we need to understand. I, I, what I also strongly believe that I mean, even as a parent, we tell kids most of the time what's best for them, and sometimes we need to ask them what's best for them, because sometimes they do know. They might be young, and I mean, you don't leave every decision up to them, but what's key to them and what's important to them, we need to know that, and we need to work from that point out and figure it out together. So instead of telling them you're going to do this, ask them, because they know. So I think that's one thing, one key piece that we miss involving them in, in the process from the beginning and not just throwing it on them. Cause that's frustrating even for us as adults. So I think that's something we need to tap into going, moving forward. Hi there. Yes. Um, good evening. Um, I was raised as a Seventh-day Adventist and I went to a Seventh-day Adventist boarding academy and like you, Helene, I felt the pain of some of my friends when I came back to Rochester and even some of my relatives saying, um, you don't talk like us, you talk like a white girl. And that was extremely painful. But when I think about Dalton, I think it would be helpful for schools like Dalton to have on their faculty, on their staff, people that look like the students they want to bring in. Because when I went to this boarding academy, um, I'll mention it, Union Springs Academy, which was on the shores of Lake Cayuga where the rippling waters flow. That was our class song. <laughs> just in case, by Auburn, New York, just in case anybody. <laughs> but when I walked onto the campus, the beautiful campus, um, there was no one there in the faculty and the administration that looked like me. And I felt so isolated, you know? And so to, I would suggest, because it's such a disservice for students to go through school without ever having any contact with other um, minorities. And with the browning of America, I think it's very important that they have this experience because they might walk into the workplace and have a person of Asian descent as their boss or someone um, that's African American. So I think it's imperative for schools who really are concerned and committed to diversity to have on their staff people that look like them. How would you? address that in, in terms of, I heard when we were watching the film, someone I heard behind me say the same thing, that there needs to be someone who looks like these young men so that they can connect. Yeah, 
you know, I, I, I would agree. I think, I think that's important. Um, I think that, um, I, th I think it goes back around to a community. I don't think there's a singular answer for, for any of this. I think, um, you know, you have people in your home and your, your immediate family who give you that positive reinforcement. You have people within your faith community to give you that positive reinforcement. You have the people within your school um, uh, they give you that positive reinforcement. It, it is such a, um, I mean, it, it's, it's just a difficult, very, very difficult time for, for young black men in general. And so you need all of these components to help and give them the, the, the kind of support they need. So as a young gentleman said from DC, you, you need all of that. You, you need all of that. So to answer your question, I don't think there is a singular solution that we can come up with. I think there, there, there are, it's not a one size fit all. There are all kinds of components that help. And I think the other thing is that, you know, um, they kind of focused a lot on the, uh, the academics and, and going to college. And one of the things that I'm a big proponent of uh, is that some of the, the, um, the, the skills that People could have, like, I think Rochester used to, they, they used to tout Edison Tech for people who wanted to be plumbers, people who wanted to be pipe fitters. But I don't know the last time anybody had their car work done, but just to get an oil change now is $50, $60 before you even get out of the car. You know, auto mechanic, painters, those, those, those kinds of careers. So, you know, um, I, I would also put that out there, not just the academics, but using those academics, using that math, using that science to play into those kinds of skill sets, construction workers, because we need all of that um, in our society. And everybody, you know, doesn't want to sit in a seat. So, and, and would do very well building a studio or, or those other kinds of things and working with your hands. And I think we've gotten so focused on the math and the science, their key components definitely but with those stem programs and engineering that we kind of we've kind of pushed those trade uh, skills to the side and I think they're an intricate part um, of, of young men's success we've talked about the the challenges what what people can do and oh yes go ahead before I well I just wanted to comment on um, how sad this movie was for me personally because and in listening to the, the woman who just spoke and talked about how important it was to have diversity on the staff of the school that she went to, and yet the solution, the success that um, Shay found was in a class where there were no white kids. And I think that, you know, the comment that his mother made about not being comfortable around white people to me it was very very sad and I'm also not sure that I agree that both of them turned out okay because it seemed to me that the Dalton school managed to screw up that kid uh, and the pressures of the overbearing parents may have screwed him up his self-esteem was so damaged that it to me the ending wasn't particularly I mean I hope that California is far enough that he can find himself <laughs> and, and get out from under those parents uh, and and so forth but it it struck me as as very sad for some of us who were involved in the civil rights movement back in the day a hundred years ago this was a very very sad movie and I understand why why that was really necessary for that for Shay to find that kind of environment but at the same time it's so frustrating for my generation to have you know fought the fight and we're fighting it over and over and over again and on 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 in this issue and Rochester has so many challenges and sometimes I think the solution might be to make education illegal because then it becomes sexy again. <laughs> Just like they did, you know, back in the day when they had the, the illegal schools in the South and back in Ireland when they wouldn't let you speak your own language and they had school in the hedgerow next to the, to the thorn bushes and had to hide and sometimes I think that our young people just need to be taught again 
you know, the value of, of education. And, and also to me, again, I think that we all have to concentrate on, you know, I, I tell my kids, you know, diversity is not about black and white. It's about your cousin up in northern Ontario who is different from you and has a totally different lifestyle. And I think that, you know, we all need a nudge. And this film was a beautiful film, but very, very, I think, sad because I'm not sure that they both are all right. I think he will be because he's in California, <laughs> but you know. So that's just a different perspective. All right. Thank you for thank you for your comment. I I, I want to close and I want to ask each of our panelists before, as we do this. What would you what advice would you give to to our African American boys in the city uh, in terms of empowering themselves? First thing you have to believe in you. That's the first thing I want to say, because I'm a parent of a 15-year-old. So that's what I tell him every day. You have the ability to become anything you want to be, and you have my support. So I explain, to my, I explain to my son and to every boy that's potentially out there that's probably going through something worse. Who knows the community you live in? But just remember, you can be whatever you be, and success is for you and it's for everybody. Just stay focused, just believe in yourself, you know, take care, remember your education is very important, go to school and learn and just never let defeat be the end for you. Believe in yourself, you can make it, you could do it, go for it. Teresa. I'll, I'll divert to, I'm still thinking about this one. I guess in some ways, <laughs> Are African American males, are they not empowered? I mean, I, I guess they have so many resources. They have lots of knowledge that we need to tap into. So is the problem really them? Or is the problem our society and the schools that don't recognize um, the wealth knowledge that they bring to the table? And so I, I go back to the beginning of the movie when the parents, you know, Idris and uh, Sheyu were in their prime at five, eager uh, for school. But once they got into school, that eagerness dissipated because of the obstacles that were presented in the school. You know, the example of when they had the little chicks and they were able to engage in that kind of hands-on learning. They had their own knowledge that they brought to it. But when they went through the kind of structured, hierarchical kind of curriculum and competition, uh, they were, you know, that chipped away at their confidence. And so we have to ask ourselves, how are we disempowering them? Right versus, because I think they have lots of power. So I don't want to look at them in a very deficit way. Uh, I think they have a lot of resources that we don't tap into. So I think the advice is really for us and not necessarily them. Um, for me, everything starts at home. It starts at home and it finishes at home. And uh, there used to be a commercial on TV. I, I, I may be dating myself a bit here, but uh, join the, the, the Marines. It's the toughest job you'll ever love. Uh, my thing is be a parent. Uh, it's the toughest job you'll ever love. Doesn't come with instructions. Doesn't come with how to. Um, each one is different. And I just think as parents from, from day one, when they're toddlers, you begin instilling in them their own sense of pride, the sense of who they are, the sense of family and community, and you continue to show them and teach them and guide them. And yes, you get frustrated, and yes, you can be overbearing. Uh, as parents, we all want what's best for them. And there's a point where they know everything and you know absolutely nothing. Uh, and it's, it's a war of attrition. You have to outlast them. Uh, you, can't, you can't let them wear you down, and, 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 and they'll give you the fight. But you know, the race is not given to the swift, but to the one that can, can endure. 
And I think if you have the tenacity and can and, and stand there because you're gonna you're gonna face some trials and tribulations, I think that's that kind of solid foundation that not only boys but all children need um, to reach their goals. So yes, you can tell them that, but you, you constantly have to show them as well. I want to thank our panelists tonight for being here. Dr. Donna Harris, Teresa Woodson. Oh yes. <laughs> now can you hear me obviously I think I, I'm uh, able to answer that question consider I'm a black male and I grew up here in Rochester I went to East High School and after that I ended up going to MCC I never furthered to a four-year institution but I'm very successful uh, as an engineer um, I think the main key from my experiences and I'm sorry your name uh, the lady in the middle oh, Teresa Teresa uh, is starting when kids are young and making sure and uh, instilling in them that you know basically you want them to be someone you want them to be successful you want them to go to college I can remember when I was like I don't know five six seven years old uh, basically my father was he, he instilled with myself my sister my brother uh, be a doctor a lawyer an engineer a school teacher, and those were kind of like the four main professions at a younger age that we had in our minds. Ironically, I never went to school to be an engineer, but I'm, a, I'm an engineer. I'm, I'm a network engineer, ironically. Uh, <laughs> that's another story. Uh, but nevertheless, it starts when, when we're young, and as you can see in the film, uh, there's a lot of answers there. They went through everyday life, it's going to be a headache. There's going to be frustrations on both parts. There's going to be failure on both parts. But at the end of the day, the parents stuck with their kids, kept pushing them, letting them know that we have certain expectations of you. And anything less is not acceptable. If you need uh, a tutor uh, because your grades are low, let's get a tutor. If there's a medical issue, let's discover that. The other part of it is having a school system that's willing to work with students and not quick to kick them out if a boy is being uh, uh, hyperactive in class. Or, uh, and I know uh, from past uh, uh, studies or past news, I have heard that more kids of color are put on medication for being uh, uh, hyper uh, in, in class than any other students. Maybe uh, part of it is diet, too much sugar or, or whatever, uh, but at the end of the day, we need to be able to work with those kids and identify any issues, keep them within the system and not kick them out, and, and just keep it moving and where we're encouraging them, we're giving them help when they need it. And at home, of course, there has to be the love there. There has to be the parent that's, that's on them, making sure that they got stuff. Uh, um, I think the... Uh, the lady at Dalton, um, she was talking about how there's an expectation when you come to the school, you have to be organized. As parents, we need to be teaching our kids that before they get to school. Um, and, and not just leave it up to the teacher and the system to try to teach the kid everything. And I think at the end of the day, um, again, there's answers in, that, in the movie. If we stay on our kids, love them, make sure that we're trying to do what we need to do to make sure that they're successful when they get older. Um, and most importantly, and I see some uh, young black males here, and actually this goes for, for any student really, you got the one that more than anybody else around you. Mm -hmm. Your parents mm -hmm. and everybody else could, could do everything uh, for you, but until you really want to be successful, until you really want to learn, until you really come up to your parents and say, hey, I'm not doing good in school, um, I need a tutor. Until you're on point and where you're not skipping school, skipping classes, getting caught up in all this whole fun stuff, uh, um, playing the video games and, and, and doing everything fun and being able to get, have more of a mindset and where, you know, I'm gonna do this for about an hour or so, but I'm gonna put this down and, and, and get back to school. You have to want it more than anybody else around you. And that's another answer to what we saw in, in the movie. Uh, we see in the film again, 
both of those boys have gone to college. Now, how are they doing college? I, I'm curious to know the next phase and, and go from there. Sorry, I, I, don't, I wasn't trying to give a no, speech. Thank you, thank you for coming <laughs> up for your comment. We appreciate it. Thanks. I just want to thank our panelists tonight, Dr. Donna Harris, Teresa Woodson, and Toyan Anderson-Willis for your time and, and for your expertise and, and for your information that you share. We appreciate it. And for those of you that are still here, um, we would ask that you fill out a short survey for our funders and you picked it up on the way in. You can answer any or all of the questions and leave it on the table on your way out and the information will help us to secure support for future screenings here uh, at the Little Theater in, in conjunction with WXXI. So if you don't mind uh, taking just a few minutes to do that and then hand that in on the way out. We appreciate you coming tonight and thank you very much. Sure.